As we reach the place climax, we feel our own spiritual sap rising. <laughs> Saps a better word than some others that spring rhymingly to mind. This is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Butley is Simon Gray's classic play about a mean-spirited and self-destructive English professor drinking his way through the first day of the term. The role is being reinterpreted now on Broadway by the wonderful Nathan Lane, and we are very pleased to have the writer Simon Gray here with us tonight. To introduce him, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Simon Gray is a leading playwright of the British theater. Butley is here on Broadway, a wonderful play. He also wrote a play that's a personal favorite of mine, The Common Pursuit, that was very popular here uh, 20 years ago and I also think is deserving of a revival. He has out now uh, The Smoking Diaries, which is uh, a rather um, uh, harrowing but very witty account of his life, and we're very happy that uh, he's on the show tonight. Welcome to Theater Talk, Mr. Gray. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm curious to know, Alan Bates is so well identified with Butley. Um, anyone who's seen the movie really cannot get that performance out of his mind. Uh, what made you think about doing it with Nathan Lane? And what does Nathan Lane bring to the character that um, Alan Bates didn't, perhaps? Well, he brings Nathan Lane, I suppose, to the character. <laughs> yes. yeah. I, I met Nathan, I mean, I've known him for a long time, and we met him um, while we were doing The Common Pursuit, actually. Mm -hmm. and at the, the first time I clapped eyes on Nathan was at the, an old audition for the Long Wharf production of The Common Pursuit, which was 74, so I don't remember dates very well, but around then, and uh, I was told that uh, there was another actor to be seen, and he was actually a comedian and a comic, and really not suitable for The Common Pursuit at all, because it, he was of the wrong world. You know? Right, musical theater guy. That perhaps. sort of thing, yes, yeah. and anyway, uh, Nathan came in and he did it, and my hair stood at the back of my neck, and I said, this is, you know, this is an actor, it's not a, he may be a comedian and a comic, but he's also a wonderful actor, so he did the, um, the Long Wolf production, and then when I went to Los Angeles to get involved in the Los Angeles production, the chap who was playing Nathan's part fell by the wayside, mm. and we were desperate. And uh, I suddenly, it suddenly, it was a thought, so to speak. Um, phoned, I phoned Nathan up. Actually, I met somebody who said that she happened to know that Nathan was free. I think he just finished the Wind in the Willows. Mm, yeah. So I phoned him up and said, "Could you by any chance, and would you be interested?" And he was on the next plane, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, he was magnificent, I thought, in New Haven. I thought he was more magnificent in at the Long Wharf. And then eventually we came to New, New York with it. And when we were in Los Angeles, we spent a lot of time together because we were both uh, slightly depressed, actually, by the Los Angeles climate. And, <laughs> I mean, it's various climates, I mean, emotional, and et cetera. And we were in the same hotel, and he was living in a, a room that was... I had a room overlooking the swimming pool, mm -hmm. and he seemed to have a room that was under it. And we used to meet at... Um, in the evenings, you know, when, when we were rehearsing, etc., and go off and have rather despairing but extremely funny dinners together. That's Nathan. And, You've got him in a nutshell. And so we, at, um, and the subject of Butley. In fact, he had seen Butley when he was sixteen. Uh, he told me, and his uh, his brother had taken him, uh -huh. and uh, he'd been very sort of st st uh, very struck by it. And that, um, so, I, I, as we began to talk about, it, I began to think that Nathan could possibly be wasn't indeed. But I thought he was. Then I thought he was a great actor. Mm -hmm. When he was doing the conversation, I was sure he was a great actor because he seemed to be full of resources. And I never saw a performance in the Common Pursuit that was the same. I mean, yeah. and I must have seen 30 performances in New Haven and, and Los Angeles and New York, and there was never a single performance that resembled any other performance, and yet it was always completely true, mm -hmm. which seems to be a characteristic of a great actor. But it was. A, and a, you find that now watching Butley, that oh, he's yes, doing that as well? Yes, each yes. performance is different? And absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it seems every, each performance is different and fresh. You know, and I read somewhere when you first were writing Butley in 1960. Six, Nine, 68, yeah, 69, Nine, yeah. Yeah, um, it's set in um, um, the office of a university professor. And while you were writing it, you were a university professor. I was. And the office on stage is very similar to the office uh, that you were actually working in. So uh, is it fair for us to say that this is a fairly autobiographical play? Well, I'm here and he's not. 
exactly <laughs> I mean. So I don't think it's that autobiographical, yeah, true. actually. Um, but I, um, the setting was certainly autobiographical, the college and the sort of sense of the, the office, the department politics, in as much as they appear in the play, are fairly yes. autobiographical. But um, I don't think of myself as, as Butley. And, uh, I've met many people who do, you know, who mm -hmm. claim that they are, in fact, the origin of Butley, including the man I shared that office with, who, really? which would have made me Joey, of course, in, <laughs> I suppose, in his view. But <laughs> the lover. Yes, the lover, yes. Well, infinite contempt for everyone, it yeah. would seem, yes. was Butley's hallmark. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. But I think it was... It was the contempt was out of a waste of what might have been. I, mm -hmm. I think you know what I like to feel is at the end of the play you feel that, that this man might have been something quite other. Yes, and, and then this, in this wretched state through his, only his own actions. Yes, really. yes. Well, it's a, like a sort of suicide, I think. But I, I, time's quite a merry one, I hope. Mm -hmm. so, so someone said to me, he's like a modern day Hamlet in. in in the sense of he's, he's constantly examining himself, and yet it's so very tragic. Yes, in the end. Yes, I suppose. Well, there's certainly a, a vein of melancholy and almost um, um, a set of lostness ab ab about him. I think uh, perhaps more so in Nathan's performance than in Alan's. I, I, I would think, but I, oddly enough, I find it hard to remember Alan's performance because. Nathan's is now in the way, you know. Mm -hmm. I think there was a point at which I could never imagine anyone else doing it, mm -hmm. really, but although quite a few actors did do it, I could never really get beyond the memory of Alan's performance, and now I can't actually see Alan's performance behind Nathan's performance, because it was a long, long time ago. But what, what? where did you, I mean, where did you draw on? I mean, was it based somewhat on your colleague in the office? a bit on your own life, your own personal frustrations, the other academics you saw. I mean, where is such a compelling character? I'm just wondering where the writer gets the material. I think it, I suppose it's from, it comes inevitably from within oneself, you know, that I, I don't think that I am Butley, but I think that many of those impulses mm -hmm. are no doubt in me. I, I can't see how else they would have got out, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in The Smoking Diaries, and you've been you know, public about this in interviews, that you, you, you don't drink anymore, but you once drank quite a bit. At the time you were writing Butley, were you drinking the way Butley drinks in the play? Yes. Not, no, 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 never in the daytime, actually. I used to drink. Uh, I would start drinking in the evening. But I drank when I wrote, and, and I used to think I could only write when I drank. So you drank while you were writing Butley? Oh, oh yes. Ah, very interesting. Yes. Why is well, that? because because one can see how, for those who haven't seen the play, Butley, it, it, as I said before, is so mean-spirited in a, a great deal of what but he says. But we're not ashamed, are we? What does Reg's daddy view? He owns a shop. And so I can see What's how some Just of that, although very Just well written and shaped, I'm amazed you were doing, could have been parents, the, the mean... Uh, meanness meat. of alcohol I mean, talking at the same time. I guess she's time. asking, were, were you a mean drunk writer? No, when you because were <laughs> Butley is a very mean drunk, and you have captured that kind of person so well. But he's a, he's a mean drunk, but he's quite a merry drunk. He's meanness. a merry drunk, but he is so, so selfish and so contemptuous of oh. everyone in a certain way. He want, he's dependent on them, and yet he's just, he just has such... He's so I think, the, I think the point is, I think the key there is that he's dependent on them, and yeah. that's, that's the problem with him, mm. I think, is that there's something in him that is both utterly dependent and deeply resentful of being dependent. I think it's partly that, you know. Mm. I don't think when I drank, I, I don't think, I, when I say I drank, I didn't, I didn't drink to drunkenness, I drank enough to, that's to, fair. to free me. Yeah, that's very interesting, yeah. because yeah. I, I don't think I could write. I can barely write at all, but I certainly couldn't write when I'm <laughs> drinking. What is that the feeling like? And do and you become dependent on that? As you said, you think you can't write without it. Well, it's a series of associations. I'm a heavy smoker, and I, yeah. and I drink. I drank heavily, and I wrote heavily. I mean, I, I wrote all the time, but I wasn't teaching. I was writing, actually, and being a father on the side in the way that one is, you know, mm -hmm. at um, that stage of one's life. And uh, the three things sort of interconnected, or seemed to me to interconnect, you know, that one drank and one smoked and one wrote. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I had to stop drinking because... Why did you stop drinking? Well, because I think another drink would... I, b I believed medically it would have killed me. Mm -hmm. I was told mm -hmm. that if I took another drink it would kill me, and I believed it. In fact, I was having dinner with Alan Bates in a restaurant, and um, opposite our house, and uh, it's very vivid, one of my most vivid... I don't have many vivid memories from after 12, I think, you know, but <laughs> one of my most vivid memories of adult life was um, meeting Alan for 
dinner, and Harold Pinter and his wife were sitting at another table, and I came in and we talked. I went to the table where Alan was waiting, and I ordered a glass of champagne. And I made a very, uh, what I thought was a, a very amusing remark about a fax from the doctor that I'd received that day saying, you must never have another drink. <laughs> and I raised my glass of champagne in toast to this fax and took a sip and nearly fainted. And I, I felt the room reeling about me. And I stood up and Alan had to take me home, actually, fortunately, it was just across the road. Mm. And uh, that was the last drink. I, the last drink I ever had was raising a glass in toast to Alan. Wow. Roughly with Harold Pinter, the director, so to speak, sitting wow. two tables away. So. What year was that? That was, oh, 10 years ago. Mm. Now, did that affect your writing? Was there a withdrawal that affected your no, writing? No, I did. No, I, I, I think I could, I think it's almost impossible that I could give up smoking, but I found drinking once I stopped. Once I stopped, I stopped. You know? mm -hmm. Occasionally, I have a yearning, you know, especially at first nights and so forth. You know, the old. Well, that's understandable. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's perfectly understandable. But the writing itself, you don't. It's, it, when you look at it, the writing before drinking, the writing after drinking, it's you don't feel there's a change in it at all. I don't know. I think. Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. I found I, I couldn't believe I could do it, and so it was a great relief to discover I could. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I'm now 70. I'm 70 next week, actually. Hmm. And uh, I'm not sure, I don't know whether I can't write at the moment because I'm, not, I'm sure it's not because I'm, drink, I'm not drinking. I'm just, <laughs> right. not, I'm just not writing. Right. Um, you're, uh, you are amazing, um, amazing cascade of words in, uh, in the Smoking Diaries. I mean, I marvel, you know, uh, being, uh, I wouldn't call myself a writer, but a newspaper hack. I, I marvel at your ability to take a sentence and just go a long time without uh, w without a period. Um, one, <laughs> one reads this and have it make wonderful sense. And have it sense. make complete sense. Yeah. I mean, it's just technically, it's a quite an interesting thing that you do throughout the Smoking Diaries. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have sentences that go on for a page and a half here. Yes. Uh, but is it stream of consciousness, or are you aware of the architecture of a very long sentence? Uh, I think so. I don't really know because I. I have such fun, frankly, d doing it that I, I don't really pay much attention to how I do it or what I'm doing, really. It's just... When you're writing, I mean, it's just, it is bubbling yeah, yes. right up. It has to be edited. I mean, you know, if, if, there's the writing, uh, and then the after, well, one can't publish all of it in a book because it also touches on subjects I couldn't bear to be seen made public. Yeah. Because, uh, the flow has, you have to go with it. And mm. so it takes you everywhere, including comments on you know that you're dearest and dearest, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all of which have to be taken out. But so will I, you al allow those to be released someday? No, 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 no. no. Uh, well, not if I can help it, anyway. <laughs> are, are you one? Are, are you the sort of writer who ha sets apart a certain type, kind, part of the day to write, or are you really constantly available to that process? No, uh, I do it at night. Actually, I, I generally write from about. 11 at night till 4 or 5 in the morning is my best time. Really? And it's always been that way? No, no. The last 10 years or so it's been that way. Mm. And at any sense of why? I mean, just any change in your life that led you to be a night owl, a night writer? Yeah, yes. I, w I, I was hospitalized for after I collapsed from the drinking. The drinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I spent three weeks on, on life support. Wow. Which meant that uh, uh, that I was I had no real sense of the shape of the day. You lose all sense. I also had hallucinations and presumably from withdrawal and all that kind of thing. And so my days became completely without form, mm -hmm. and I've never been able to recover the form of a day. Actually, so it, I I find myself working at night because that seems that's when I want to write, yeah. and I don't. Uh, so I get up at very bad hours, like twelve or one. You're in the theatre, Whatever darling. works, yeah. yeah <laughs> Whatever yeah. works. Um, well, it means you miss a lot of daylight. And in winter, it's very depressing because you actually have, <laughs> in London, you have an hour and a half of daylight the way I live. You know? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you, one of the characters that um, uh, comes up quite a bit in this book is your close friend, uh, Harold Pinter. Yes. And you write about um, um, hearing about his cancer from him. And uh, I, I know you're still close to him. How is he, how is he doing now? Well, I spoke to him this morning, actually. He's just been on the stage. He's doing perhaps last tape at the Royal Court. Oh. So that's how he's doing, you know? Yeah, yeah well, wonderfully well. Yes, he's doing it on, in a wheelchair because he finds standing and walking 
a bit difficult at the moment, but he's, you know, he's apparently he's whipping around the stage and he's doing the play, so. And having a great time, yeah. A very uh, touching point in this diary, though, when, when he does, I think you're having dinner with him, right, when he tells you that uh, mm. he's been diagnosed with cancer. What was that, uh, if you could sort of tell us what that moment was like as you do in the book? It was just uh, uh, the basic shock. I mean, it was just a shock, the shock of discovering that uh, he said it with a, such a matter-of-fact way. But, but also, we bumped into him by accident. We happened to go into the restaurant, and they were sitting at the table, and uh, um, he was looking very grave. And uh, but we sat with him and talked for a bit, and it was, uh, it was an uneasy conversation. Um, and then he suddenly announced, or stated rather as a fact, that he just discovered that he had he'd been diagnosed with cancer. And he was already beginning to think about what that Im involved him in, what sort of future that involved him in. You know, chemo they discussed already chemotherapy and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I did think it uh, also shocking, because I'd always kind of assumed that Harold was indestructibly there, whereas other lives like mine were slightly fragile. When you say he'd always be there, was he a, a person of great discipline and constitution? I did, well, yes, I think. Not dissipated I, uh, in any way? Well, I, it's partly because uh, he, he directed my first, uh, he directed Butty was the yeah. first thing. Yes, right, we, right, right. I think he directed nine, eight or nine of my plays. And in the course of that, we developed a relationship in which was also assumed the direct uh, playwright relationship, which is slightly become slightly avuncular in a way, so that he became for, for a time a kind of stern uncle or a gentle stern uncle. And, uh, and one's uncles and fathers, etc., are immortal, you know, as mm. in, in one sense of them. What's it like, though, that relationship? Because he's, uh, like you, he's a great playwright. I mean, here you are writing, you know that Harold Pinter, great playwright, is overseeing everything that you write. Is he a good editor? Does he push you as a writer? And no, no, no. We, no, I send him. Uh, no, we. we uh, um, when I finish, uh, when I, well, when he w the days when he was directing, he can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But in the days when he was directing, and I, uh, the Old Masters, I think, was the last play he'll, uh, he'll direct, or so he said. But when I finished a play, if I thought it had the right feel to it for him, I sent it to him. And if I thought it wasn't, I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, but we never discussed it really. We never talked about what we were doing, what we were, when we met, which we did often get cricket matches. We scarcely ever talked about writing. Mm -hmm. We talked about cricket or. <laughs> Mainly about cricket, actually, in those days. <laughs> uh, are you writing? Um, uh, you said you weren't writing now, or well, not at the moment. No, I, I just finished uh, a year or so ago. I finished a play about Dickens. Oh, uh, Dickens and uh, Ellen Turnan, his young mistress. Oh, well, that sounds mistress. good. Oh, that's it. Now, how did you stumble upon, uh, upon that subject? Well, I, I guess being an old college professor, you know a lot about uh, Dickens. No, I, well, I knew something about Dickens. I'd always wanted to write play about Dickens. When I was about the age when I was writing Butley, I wanted to write an, a biographical play about Dickens. And uh, Peter Hall asked me if I wanted to do anything for the National when he was running it, and I said, yes, I'd love to do this play about Dickens, actually. And he said, OK, go ahead. And uh, that was OK until a check arrived from the National, which was the, um, what's it called, uh, the advance. Yes. 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 And it actually rendered me totally impotent the moment it arrived. I thought I, I found I could no longer write a word. I kind of collapsed under the weight of the responsibility. And with a check, there was a note saying we thought we might do it at the, on the Olivier stage on such and such a day. <laughs> right, right. So that really finished me off. <laughs> that's, a, that's the creative process nowadays. Yes, yes. Hit the deadline. Yes. I think that's a very honorable response you had. Well, it wasn't. I, uh, yes, but I would, pref I would have preferred to have written the play. So you put this play, it, it stops the play. Yes, well then, yeah, that's right, for 20 odd years. And uh, then I read a book by um, Claire Tomlin called yep. um, The Invisible Woman, which was about Dickens's relationship with Ellen Turner. And I'd known about the relationship before, but here it was very carefully documented. Mm -hmm. And I became very interested, and so I met with her and talked with her. And, uh, after many, many and many a draft, a play emerged, which actually Peter Hall is going to direct, oddly enough. I mean, things coming around in circles. So did they give you another advance? Yeah, I was going to say, you're, no, you're, you're no, a producer's no. dream writer. <laughs> yeah. They don't have to pay you. No, well, they do after, <laughs> yes. After they've got the play and they want to do it, they have to pay me. Yeah, but um, no, no, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the, anyway, it's for, the, 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 I, never, I never took another advance from then on. I, I realized that it was fatal. Mm, interesting. Well, when you look at Butley now, um, these almost, what, 
35 30, years. 35 yeah. years later. Do you look at your a play you wrote 35 years later with some detachment, and do you say, this this scene doesn't work anymore, I wish I'd done this, I want to fix that, I want to do something else with it, or are you pretty pleased with the way the, the play has endured for, for 35 years? Well, there's nothing I could do to it, because it was written in a way by somebody else, you know, uh, 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 when I was, when I was 32, I think, when I wrote it, or 30, something like that, and that's, that was less than half my lifetime ago, if you mm. see what I mean. Um, and do you look at it as a play written by somebody else? Are you uh, partly, astounded yes. by it? Well, I don't try to look at it as a, uh, as, a, as a member of the audience as best I can and, and um, see where I think something, where I can say something helpful to the director or the actor. Yeah, so how are you involved, as we're taping this, at least in previews, how are you involved in the process of this production? Well, I go every evening and I talk to the director. Of course, I talk to Nathan every evening, but I mean... Um, and what do you talk about? Well, either the play or, 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 or something else. Do you give him pointers? or? Uh, uh, well, we talk about it. I mean, it's difficult to say, really. Things uh -huh. come up in conversation, and then I talk to Nicholas Martin every morning for an hour or two. You know, really? So. so uh, so we proceed. A lot of writers tell me they have this constant desire to rewrite. I mean, you know, Ed Edward Albee has yeah. always wanted to rewrite, changing things when yeah. they see their own plays. Do you have that impulse? Not with that play. I mean, no, I mean, it seems to me, whatever it is, you know, it is itself, and I, it would be an impertinence to interfere with it. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, even if lines don't work, I couldn't, I couldn't find a line to replace it, I don't think. So I am... I I know you can't tell us, but I am so intrigued about what you talk about with Nicholas Martin for an hour every oh. day. You know that you're that you, you're well, involved. Some, well, no, just sort of practical things like whether scenes should be, you know, pauses that should go and and that kind of stuff. You know, very, very minute very kind ordinary. of dissection yes, of just, scenes just, and things. Just de just de details. I mean, he's wonderfully open. We know we got to know each other very well in Boston, yes. so we found we could talk to each other very easily. Were so you involved in the casting? No, not here. No, no, no. no I wasn't. No, I wasn't. Um, no, that had to be done by telephone. <laughs> I mean, I that's the interesting concept of casting yes. by telephone. <laughs> no, I uh, <laughs> Are you writing um, more of diaries? I know you have one that's just come out called "The Year of the Jouncer." Yes. That's just come out. What is Jouncer, by the way? What does that mean? It means a baby who rocks in his pram and sings to himself in order to get to sleep. Actually, is that I autobiographical? Think. Yes, yes, entirely. Yes, yes. <laughs> really, you think? Yes. You, yes. You see, I used, yes. I used to make the pram perambulate across the garden by bouncing in it, and apparently I sang when I did it. And in those days, you know, they used to leave babies in prams in the garden without uh, having to watch them all the time. And they now you'd be arrested for that in the nanny state that you yes, live in. Yes. <laughs> but they were disconcerted to find the pram in a different place. You know, every every <laughs> when they came back, because you an hour were... later, I'd actually moved it. Yes, <laughs> and so they watched from a window or somewhere once to see what was actually going on, and they saw this pram bobbing along the garden path. <laughs> and was you. terrible noise coming from it. I suppose and they a should have known you were coming, yes. I suppose yeah. there's a metaphor for life. Yeah. There's some, Something, somewhere, some yeah. And are you writing di your diaries at night, too? I mean, is that always uh, Yes, on? yes. It's not really diaries. They're sort of, I suppose they're memoirs rather than diaries. I, I have to ask you, though, why has it been, you've been away from New York for so long, though? I mean, there was the common pursuit, and then... Uh, the, yes, and there was a... a, 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 a I think the, the climax of my drunken theatrical life was the Holy Terror, which I directed myself and collapsed. And I think three nights here on Broadway. I, I, no, no, it was at the uh, the Promenade. Ah, and that oh, that, that was a harrowing experience. You directed that yourself, and I did. Yes. Not in a bad. You were you were not in a very good state when you were directing it then. Huh? I was not. No. Mm. Because the play benefit by a director who would be in a better state. I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, I've never found out. I don't think. I, have you missed being from New York? I mean, is it nice to be back here? Because you were... It is. Yes, yes, I used to love coming to New York. It's, yes, I, I love New York. I'd find the, the smoking laws extremely... make my life extremely difficult. <laughs> I, uh, Tom Stoppard phoned me two days ago, actually, to say that um, we found all we were talking about, two elderly English playwrights were talking about where you could smoke, you know? <laughs> It was a sad conversation, really, as if we were <laughs> schoolboys. <laughs> I hate to break it to you, but I think there's some push in England to have these uh, is, kind yes. of laws as well. Okay, well, this is good practice. It's coming in June, actually. Really? Mm. So you'll be confined. You won't be able to write at a bar the way I did. You once write mm. at bars and yes, cigarettes yes, and all this. Yes, yes, to do that. Yeah, yeah. no, uh, you, no I, it'll be very difficult. I think we're going to find find. 
Well, I, advo I, clubs, I yeah. advocate in New York the uh, Simon Gray, Tom Stoppard exception for smoking in bars when you come in with a page and a pen to allow you to write more diaries in place. <laughs> um, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Good. good luck with Butley uh, at the um, Booth Theater with Nathan Lane. Uh, welcome back to New York, Simon Gray, and thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Thank you very much. How's the baby? Oh, very well. Uh, as far as one can tell, with babies, I mean. Yes, they are indecipherable, aren't they?